kind of tongue in cheek way of uh, talking about SecOps detection, mixing this in, but uh, looking at this from a threat emulation perspective. So that's kind of where we're going to go with this. My wife bakes bread. And so this was kind of top of mind as I was trying to write this abstract. So this is me. Um, I've been doing this for 20 some years. Um, spent time initially in SecOps. I've moved into more threat hunting and detection engineering. Um, currently, I focus on content development at Google Cloud. And uh, the way I kind of got into this was around building adversary emulations around APT actors. And, and prior to coming to Google Cloud, I had done this uh, with a blue team capture the flag uh, called Boss of the Sock, if anybody's played that before. And so that's kind of where I've gotten into this. Some other information about me, happy to chat about any of those things. So we're going to kind of start back at the beginning um, but as we get into this. And so... You know, whenever you stand up a SecOps, and I'm going to use term SecOps and SOC and a couple of these other terms kind of interchangeably, so I apologize because I know that's sometimes important. It, the terms are important, but just kind of abstractly, we're going to talk about these kinds of things broadly. And we have organizations, and we oftentimes start off with a set of logs and we have events, and we have all of these good intentions to detect badness, and we probably have a few ideas as to how we're going to start doing these kinds of things with use cases. But over time, things change, right? Organizations collect more information. Organizations acquire other organizations, right? Uh, risk profiles change, right? All these kinds of things change. And our good intentions to detect badness continue. You know, that's kind of the constant. But now we've got all of these initial detection use cases that we stood up our sock on, and we've got all these existing rules. And we probably added a couple new detections and a couple new use cases and rules along the way because of our organization changing. Now, one of the questions I think people would ask, and this was kind of tackled a couple different times yesterday during some sessions that I was sitting in, was can't we just go ahead and keep adding use cases and rules, right? We just kind of keep piling them on top, right? We just kind of keep shoveling them on top. And we end up with a legacy debt out there, right? Where we have detections from five years ago that we've always continued to run because, well, we've always run them. And, you know, maybe they're from two or three sims ago. We always need to be asking ourselves, do the use cases that we have align to our tools? Right, Because at the same time, some of those use cases and maybe some of the ways that we solve these use cases are aligned with technologies that maybe aren't really doing the job, or I'm not even using that technology anymore. But again, we've always done it this way, so why don't we do it this way? Uh, right? We need to kind of break those kinds of things. So there's constant thought around some of these pieces that we need to go ahead and think about the use cases that we're running in our SOC and saying, do they still align with our business processes? Do they still align with our risk tolerance? Do they align with the data sets that we have, right? But we need to constantly be challenging ourselves and thinking about those things. Another thing I get asked from time to time is, is hey, can I just go ahead and buy or download my use cases? Um, sure, you could, right? I mean, there was a great presentation two sessions ago around Sigma. Sigma is a great repository of detections, right? At the same time, um, you know, we, there's, you know, we, uh, the team that I want, uh, I'm on, we build a set of community rules at, at Google Cloud. Uh, Microsoft has a set. Elastic has a set. Splunk has a set, right? Lots of places are generating these kinds of open source rules. And in fact, there's businesses that are being built around this big specific business model where you're building detections and selling them. The problem with all of these things is that they are really, really good enablers, right? These are resources that are enables. They are a means to the end. They're not the end themselves because... If your organization doesn't have the kind of tooling that these signatures are, uh, or alerts are associated with, they don't align to my risk posture, and they don't align to, most importantly, the threats that I face as an organization, they're not going to be impactful, right? I can say I'm running a 1,000 rules, but what's the point if it doesn't align to my risk posture in my organization and the threats that I face? So with that kind of as our backdrop and challenges, what I want to talk about a bit about is around some approaches to doing emulation and threat emulation, specifically to adversary emulation. I want to talk about some of the considerations that we've got when crafting an emulation and a couple of different ways that you can do that. And then I'm going to kind of tie all that back together with building detections based on the emulations that I've got. And so that's kind of the three, three things we're going to be touching on today. Hopefully I can make this entertaining as we go too. So when we start talking about emulation, and simulation, right? These terms are sometimes kind of thrown out there, um, you know, six of one, half a dozen the other. So I kind of like to go ahead and use a level set here. And I did a little bit of research and kind of came up with these terminology. And I was like, yeah, this just sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and leverage this. So we're going to talk about emulation. Simulation still has a lot of valid points. It's important to have, but basically looking for general attack patterns, general behaviors, focusing on vulnerabilities and weaknesses, 
not focused on adversary specific. That's kind of simulation. And again, there's a good space in this. There's a good need to do those kinds of things. But when we talk about emulation, we're talking about focusing on an adversary, focusing on their attack lifecycle, so looking at specific TTPs. And that's kind of where we're going to go with this. Now, there's lots of different ways to, uh, to uh, simulate or emulate, right? Um, I didn't even put red team up here because obviously red team is a very, very good way of going about doing that. Uh, something that's more in vogue uh, has become the purple team, right? The, the fusion of that, right? Where we've got a red team subject matter expertise is going to bring their, their knowledge and the blue team is going to bring their knowledge of the defensive landscape and we're going to put them together and work collaboratively. Now, there's personnel cost associated with that. But the idea in theory is, is that we can focus on the threats we care about. We have subject matter expertise on both sides and it's going to turn out well. Now, that having been said, I presented this to some internal teammates as I was kind of building this out. And literally one of the first things one of them said was, yeah, we tried this at a different organization and we had a toxic environment with the red team and the blue team uh, at each other's throats and it failed miserably. So that's the cautionary tale with a purple team. So it's something to keep in mind is, is that you do need to have good, strong leadership there to go ahead and make sure that everybody's kind of pulling their oar in the right direction or in the same direction, I should say. Another way you can go ahead and do emulation is automated red teams. And automated red teams can be good because obviously you could do something on a regular basis. You don't necessarily have to bring folks in. Automation can be a very, very powerful thing uh, and up-leveling folks. Um, but again, when you're doing automated red teaming, you also need to keep in mind is the automated red team capabilities that exist, do they align with the threats that I care about? If they aren't doing the threats that I care about, it's just going to go ahead and I'm generating stuff, but what's the point? Uh, similarly, does the output of those automated red teams give me information that allows me to up-level my blue teams? If I don't have specific courses of action and, and, and points for improvement, how can I be a better blue team by just saying, oh, well, the red team owned me again? Great. How do we how do we help the defender? Right. That's our focus. So when we start talking about emulation, we need to think about what do we want to accomplish? And so I kind of put this on a continuum of kind of the the one, the many and then the lots and kind of the the, the, th the thread through here. So um, when we start talking about actions, we start talking about atomic detections, right? A singular kind of thing that's happening out there. And uh, the Red Canary Atomic Red Team, again, mentioned earlier today, uh, is a good way to talk about that because it's something very easy to set up. I run something, I see an output in my log, I write a detection on that. And that's good, right? That's a way to do that. The kind of the midterm I kind of refer to as unit tests, we also refer to as sequences where you, maybe you have some sort of initial access, um, maybe based on a piece of malware, maybe you have some sort of an RDP session open, and then you start seeing like tool transfer, right? Ingress tool transfer happening. That segment of that kill chain, so to speak, is uh, what I would refer to as a unit test or a sequence, right? So that's a smaller part that you can emulate. And then you have the end-to-end -end sequence, right? This end-to-end -end kind of scenarios can get very complex because they can take up a lot of time. There's lots of different pieces to test and test the interoperability of these pieces. So I kind of think of this as taking those unit tests and putting them together like Legos. Um, but the benefit of exposing your analysts to end-to-end -end scenarios is a couple of different things. One, it gives them a chance to better understand the adversary, right? There's, a, there's always a challenge that if I'm looking at singular detections, I lose the forest for the trees. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody, uh, right? So I get too, too focused on the, on the myopic piece of it and I lose that, that broader picture. The other thing I can do with this is, is as I start looking towards the detection part of this, I can also, also go ahead and expose them to multiple kinds of events and start driving understanding that detection X over here and detection Z here, when chained together can be incredibly impactful, whereas this maybe this other thing Y over here just becomes a distraction in the grander scheme of this overall end-to-end -end scenario. So I tend to be a bigger proponent of the end-to-end -end scenario. I know it's a lot more work. I know it's a lot more challenging. And again, there's not a right or wrong answer to this, but it's a way to be able to get that more holistic view around an adversary and what they're doing in your environment. So if you decide you want to build something end-to-end, -end, um, I kind of think of it as like, here's a couple of different ways that you can get started. And I'll touch on different parts of this as we kind of go through the next set of slides. But we'll start with the imagination, right? The unicorns and rainbows. Uh, we've got experience. We've got threat intelligence, and then we've kind of got a little, uh, we kind of an ace up our sleeve, so to speak, which is the MITRE uh, Center for Threat Informed Defense Adversary Emulations Plans. And I'll talk about all of this here as we go. So the first thing that you want to do as you're building your emulation is you need to stop and think about it and say, what do we want to detect? What do we care about? What do we want to prioritize within our environment? 
this goes to the experience part of those, those four little pillars that I had out there, right? So who, of course, is targeting us? What are those platforms, applications, and services that we want to align to? What are the detection gaps that we have in our environment, either that, are, that we're aware of or we're not aware of, but basically based on the experiences that we're seeing on our SOC on a regular basis? Man, we got burned by this thing over here. Okay, well, that might be something we want to start thinking about saying that's a detection gap and how can we fill that? Another way to prioritize is thinking about what do we need to defend, which I realize we should be doing this on a regular basis anyway, but it's a good way to kind of kind of readdress this and put it up front, which is again, what are our crown jewels? If an adversary is looking to get into our system, what is the systems of most interest? What are the data sets that they want to get at? And also from a user perspective, who are those most vulnerable users, right? The admin with all of the accesses, the C staff and their administrative assistants who have the strategic vision of the company and their documents, um, the R&D teams, right? Who are those people that we need to be most focused upon and how can we go ahead and introduce them into these emulations? Those are kinds of things to be thinking about, but leveraging that experience that you bring to the table, just doing the defensive job every day. And then we get to data generation. So data generation is kind of a fun one. Um, I put two very obvious places. Where could I generate my emulation? I could do it in production, or I could do it in a development enclave, right? And there's pros and cons for both, because I'm sure people go, oh my God, we're not going to run an emulation in production. Well, I mean, you kind of do, if you'd run a red team, you might be doing that in production anyway. Now, the best part about ever running anything in production is, is you get a very, very good feeling as to what are the configurations and what are the security controls and what does the uh, IT architecture look like? And in that point in time is a very, very accurate representation because that's where the other attacks are happening, right? Um, but at the same time, if we have analysts that are monitoring and everything else, we need to make sure that they either understand that they're responding to these just like they would anything else, or we need to be able to flag them so they're not chasing these emulations that are being, being run through the system. The other thing you got to think about from a production perspective and emulation is malware. Are you going to include malware in your emulation? I'll put a pin in that one because we'll come back to that at the end as well. But that's uh, definitely something you would keep in mind. If we're looking at this from a development perspective, right? Development perspective is, is there's more effort because you gotta go ahead and stand up your analytics engine. You gotta stand up some infrastructure to be able to put this together. But on the pro side of that is, is that when you blow it up, you could just clean it up, right? You, 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 you tear it all down and you know nobody's the wiser. But, and I've seen this far too often, is, is that folks like to use their endpoint and their network detection policies and they crank them up to 11, kind of like Spinal Tap, okay? They've got those things locked down. They've got MS Defender running everything on, right? The reality of that is, is that does not align with the production environment. And so all of a sudden, yeah, I'm getting stuff lighting up from an emulation perspective, but it doesn't represent my production environment, right? That SQL server that I stood up for my, um, for my, uh, for my emulation, it's patched in the lab, but the reality is its partner in production hasn't been patched in two years because it can never go offline. Right. So these are the kinds of shortcomings that if you go ahead and put it in production, you need to take into account what the real world looks like and put that same real world in your environment. Same thing with other applications. They need to be representative. The cloud policies need to be representative as well if you're running a hybrid or a cloud only kind of emulation, too. So this brings us to enterprise uh, to uh, to threat intelligence. And where does that fit? Threat intelligence is great because it helps us prioritize. Right. Ideally, you have a you have some idea as to who is targeting you. So the ability to go up and say, hey, I care about this specific actor and understand a little bit more about their actor, their TTPs. What are the kinds of things that we need to be doing from an emulation can be very impactful. It also does provide fodder for detections just even before you get started. And of course, there's lots and lots of IOCs. But cautionary tale around the IOCs is not to over rotate and get solely focused on the IOCs. And here's why. Most people, I'm, I'm slightly surprised I didn't see any other pyramids of pain this week. Um, I feel like I need to give David another dollar every time I use uh, uh, his pyramid. Um, but David Bianco's pyramid of pain uh, is, is a wonderful little reference. It's a good way to kind of keep grounded in IOCs, if you ask me. Um, for those not familiar with it, the hash, the IPs, and the domains, the stuff at the bottom, right? And it says simple, easy, trivial. Simple, easy, trivial means it's, you know, pretty simple, easy, and trivial for us to detect. It's also simple, easy, and trivial for an adversary to switch out and get something else in there that we don't recognize, right? If we work our way up the stack, 
identifying the tools an adversary uses, identifying the TTPs an adversary uses can be tough and can be challenging for us, but it can also inflict the most pain on the adversary if we start tra tracking that and finding that on a regular basis. So it kind of cuts both ways. The thing I like about IOCs and my adversary emulations is, is I like to go ahead and sprinkle them in to give a little bit of flavor for people to kind of be thinking about this to kind of help align with some of these processes. But we don't want to spend all our time focusing on those hashes, IPs, and domains. We want to give maybe an, an emulation a little bit of that to get a feel for things. Maybe people go, oh, okay, well, this has some indicative qualities of this threat actor. Let's look at what other TTPs and tools that they have, and then we can go ahead and chase those down as well. But be very, very careful about not getting sucked into the whole IOC hype and focusing just all your eggs in the IOC basket for emulation. And this brings us to attacking and defending in the cloud. Um, because we are in a hybrid uh, world that we have more and more workloads operating in the cloud and we have multiple clouds that folks tend to put their workloads in as well as SaaS solutions, we might want to go ahead and exercise some of these as part of our emulation as well. Now, I did this 2018 with a team when we built an emulation that was around AWS with EC2 and S3. So it's six years later, which is good. But I recall at that point in time when we wanted to go ahead and do some basic kinds of stuff um, in that space, we had to fill out a form that says, hey, we're going to go ahead and run this in our AWS environment. Okay. Um, this is obviously not an exhaustive list of the links that are out there, right? This is this is the Azure, the GCP, and the AWS link. But I highly recommend you take a look at that and your SaaS providers that you utilize to understand what they consider acceptable and unacceptable before you start running adversary emulations in these environments. Okay, because again, we're tenants. It's a little bit like the landlord, right? You don't start, you know, turning the stereo up and banging on the walls after ten o'clock at night. You got to keep those things in mind. So do your homework with that. Which then brings us to the MITRE CTID emulation plan. So one of them I did this uh, over, over the winter here as I was building this out and I came across these uh, was based on a nation state actor. You can take a look at it and kind of figure out what it is or don't give you your homework to go ahead and do that. But what it did was it basically gave me a Windows-based environment that utilized a representative sample of, of uh, systems, Exchange, SQL, Active Directory, and a workstation. And really the flow of this emulation plan that MITRE had created is to provide a workstation compromise, led to a web shell on the Exchange server. That uh, web shell would then go ahead and uh, dump tools, execute processes, and then move laterally to the SQL server, gather up information, exfiltrate, and off we go, just like an adversary would, a specific named nation state adversary. Now, the benefit of leveraging something like the emulation plans that Miner makes available is that I can go ahead and exercise my controls, and I don't have to be focused as standing up an adversary. So again, this goes back to the red team, blue team kinds of things, right? Most of what I spend my time doing is blue team. I kind of spend a little time on my red team when I have to build an emulation. But you know what? At some point in time, you know, when you're time constrained, being able to leverage these emulations and then also what they refer to as micro emulation plans, which are smaller subsets of this, allow us to go ahead and leverage these things and kind of be a, um, a, a force multiplier in terms of building this out. Now, because it is an end-to-end -end scenario, I definitely recommend unit testing of these components is required to be able to do that. Um, but this also goes back to the imagination piece, which I know I touched on, but I didn't come back to. Anytime you build an emulation, you need it rooted in reality because otherwise, hey, we're gonna have our, you know, imagine the most outrageous thing. Okay, what's the opportunity or what's the chances of that happening in our environment? If it's very, 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 very low, do we really wanna spend our time on that or something else? But in this example, I have a federated AD uh, Active Directory environment. I've got some O365 floating around there. I got some Entra ID, and I wanted to expand this a little bit broader. Or maybe I want to add additional workstations into this because I want to create some more noise on the on the um, on the um, of the logging that I'm going to have to work with to build detections, which is the thing we'll get to next. That's where you go ahead and put some of that imagination in here, or maybe some spins to kind of keep your analyst on their toes. Um, so they don't go, oh, yeah, yeah, we've seen this emulation plan somewhere else, right? Give them a twist in there. Give them a different technique, maybe in the midst of it. All right. So when it gets to the uh, emulation, what are we looking at? Well, this is kind of a six steps that I laid out. You'd execute your actions against your security controls. Ideally, your logging is happening. If your logging's not happening, we kind of have to go back to the beginning, right? Uh, don't pass go, don't collect $200 for the Monopoly fans out there, right? You kind of got to have start all over again. Uh, obviously, we're assuming that you're getting your logging infrastructure is in place. Once you have that, you're going to have to analyze those logs. 
you're going to ask yourself, do I go, can I go ahead and see what the security controls that I have here that I'm running against inform against my action? What do the logs tell us? And then do I have multiple data sets that kind of um, corroborate or provide additional insulation in case one of my data sets gets knocked offline? So from an analysis perspective, what I like to kind of do is build my emulation. I have an emulation plan, but then I annotate based on after executing it to kind of go, okay, what am I seeing? It also allows me to go back if I'm building content or I'm gonna go ahead and test rules to know actually when this thing happened in my environment. So being able to go back and say, hey, on January 25th, I got some Windows events, I got some Sysmon events, I happen to have some CrowdStrike in there and uh, there's actually some EDR, I'm um, some NDR logs in there as well, but it allows me to kind of go and that's my point in time reference to go, okay, now I'm gonna build a, a rule around web shells. Where can I test my web shell action? Because I know that this is a curl statement here. It gives me those point in time references to find what I'm actually looking for as I validate my rules. Um, I want to go ahead and take a look at this and say, what kinds of controls do I have? In this case, again, I've got a 4688, I've got a Sysmon 1, I've got my NDR, so I can see uh, some core light connections. So I can kind of sit there and say, yeah, I'm seeing the pieces I'm expecting to see. I'm seeing the data parsed. I feel pretty good about this because that moves us then towards the next steps, which is obviously getting into the detection parts of this. So... Um, again, MITRE in their emulation plan did a great job. They lay out the MITRE attack techniques. They put them in red, all of the different ones that are referenced inside of their emulation plan. And so I took a sample of them and put them on the left side of the screen here. And so first thing you want to ask yourself is, is okay, great. We're building detections for all these techniques, right? No, I hope not. Okay. And the reason for that is, is that there's some of these in here that are very, very lend themselves to building detections, right? Uh, credential dumping, pass the hash, phishing, um, web shell, right? There's some good ones there. You're gonna write a detection on file deletion atomically, that's, and then deploy it. You know, I'm not sure what you're, exactly what you're gonna get out of that, right? We'll get to, get, get to some secondary steps. Valid domain account is always a tough one. What do you do with a valid domain account? Yep, we got another valid domain account. Right? That's not a detection. In the context of other things, it can become a detection, but you need to be thinking about that. Um, so that's why I also don't like to have folks over rotate too hard on MITRE ATT&CK. It's a great roadmap, but it's not the end result when it comes to that. So one of the things I could do, though, is when I start looking at um, the tactics, right? Inside of it, you have a tactic, and inside of that, I've got a bunch of techniques and sub-techniques, is I could start looking at this from the adversary perspective and say, okay, my emulation ran, and they appear to do a large number of discovery tactics as they initially land and start getting a feel for what's the configurations of the victim systems they're landing on. So maybe instead of going ahead and saying, well, I'm gonna write a who am I signature, and a system info signature, and a net, uh, net group signature, right? All of those things. Instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and roll those up at a tactical level and say, these are all the kinds of adversary tactics that I would expect my adversary to be doing and go ahead and roll them up into a singular detection and say, hey, on this system, we saw 14 of these, or on this system, we saw eight of them and be able to do that and have it a little bit more, uh, more chewable for our analysts to work with. I could look at doing compound rules where I'm spanning across the NDRs and EDRs of the world, right? So in this case, I have a core light and I had a Sysmon. Sysmon's not really not an EDR, but I also it's similar to a crowd strike where I can go ahead and look at those processes. Now I started looking at this because I said, you know what? What the as I start analyzing this, I see network connection and then I see process or file creations that the adversary was doing. And what I wanted to do with that is say, okay, what can I do to go ahead and detect these kinds of things? Now. What I found, and this is again where some of the things that came up uh, yesterday, I think it was in Carson's talk, uh, where you know you get a challenge of having a good detection, right? Where you got to go ahead and get that balance between the too much noise and the too few detections, right? And 100% hit rate, you know, and dealing with false positives, those kinds of things are all things we have to grapple with. But what I also kind of landed on is is that maybe this web shell that I was trying to rule, I was trying to write, wasn't great because I didn't necessarily know which file paths to work with or which IP addresses to work with, but I could use it as a really good hunting detection because if I have these other indicators that I've come across during a hunt or during an investigation, I could plug those into this and very quickly be able to see this web shell pop out of nowhere, right? So again, thinking about things about compound and putting those distinct pieces together. Uh, inside of the emulation, there was a um, beaconing capability that was in there. Inside that beaconing, we looked at it and said, okay, we can do some things with behavior. Um, now, the reason I didn't go with process is that the process launches were being seen so frequently that it was very, very hard to separate the signal and the noise from one another. 
task scheduler was something that was in the emulation plan that allowed me to go ahead and say, maybe I could do some frequency analysis. So frequency analysis is another, another method from a detection perspective that I could bubble up. Um, baselining is great. Now, baselining gets a little tougher when you start looking at emulations, because if you're only running an emulation for an hour or four hours or even eight hours, depending what you're looking to baseline, that could be a little bit more problematic because you just don't have that uh, breadth of data to go ahead and establish what that baseline looks like. But it's something to think about, maybe extrapolate over a very short period of time to extrapolate over a longer time. Things to think about. Um, the other things I was looking at with the beaconing is, is when I understand what accompanied this continual beacon. Well, we'd see process launches, we'd see network connections of a certain type that allows us to go ahead and build out on those different pieces. Where we're trying to go with all of this at the end of the day is to go ahead and boost our overall detection quality. So if you're just getting started and you got nowhere else to start, right? Credential dumping, Mimikatz, we'll use the classic example, which is actually part of the plan. Um, MITRE changed the name, but they used the default uh, GitHub download of Mimikatz, right? So if I'm leaning hard into my IOCs, I'll get a hit. I won't want to get a hit on the name, okay? But that's fine. Um, but maybe I want to get a little bit better with my detection, right? So maybe rather than worrying about the name and worrying about the hash, because maybe I go ahead and download it from somewhere else, uh, that somebody else has pre-compiled it, so the hash is going to be different. Maybe I start looking at command strings, and I start looking at the command strings that are being issued and going, hey, you know, a Sucursa colon colon PTH past the hash is something that if I see that, I probably want to flag on it. I don't care what the hash is. I don't care what the, uh, the name of it is, right? But that raises the bar a little bit. Now, if the adversary goes ahead and uh, and and um, recompiles it and changes uh, the past the hash to hatch colon peppers, you can tell what I was cooking the day I was making stuff here, um, then that changes things as well, right? That raises the bar for us to be able to detect it. Where we want to get to the point of is being able to go ahead and look for something like LSS access. Then we look for trailing events, maybe over port 445. Maybe then we look for the PS exec that comes after that or the attributes associated with PS exec. Basically getting up to those higher levels where we're looking more at those tools and those TTPs rather than down at those IOCs that we talked about before, right? Again, if you're starting off in these spaces and you're trying to do these things, it's not to say not to do this stuff at the bottom. You absolutely start at the bottom, but you want to kind of take this crawl, walk, run approach to keep boosting up the level of the detection and looking to move into those higher level behavior kinds of detections as you go. And I told you I'd come back to malware, so we're coming back to malware here. There's lots of places to get malware. You can download your own. It is up to you to defang it if you're going to run it in your environment, particularly in your production environment or even your development environment. Um, the thing I liked about the, uh, the MITRE emulation plans was it provided what I refer to as malware without the mess. Um, now, if the emulation plans that you're looking at doing don't align with the adversaries, obviously that's not going to be necessarily helpful, but it's something to be considering as you're going through this. The last part that I wanted to make the point on around malware though is, and I, I, we struggled with this as I built these emulations over time, there's so many things that are happening due to a phishing foothold and then you're in the system. The question is, is how many times do I need to emulate phishing to, to kind of kick off, my, uh, kick off my emulation? Or do we just kind of sit here and say, you know what, we're not going to worry about that. We're going to assume breach and we're going to start from there. Between uh, living off the land binaries, other nice friendly utilities of like the PS exec genre family and everything else and off the shelf C2 platforms, there's a lot of things to work with there that adversaries are using that maybe I don't care about the boutique um, uh, malware that's out there because it actually creates more headaches for me as I'm building out these emulations. And maybe I want to focus on what's happening in my network. And if you're thinking about emulating for insider threat, they're already inside the network anyway. So maybe I'm not going to even worry about that initial access. Again, not a right or wrong answer, but something to think about. So once we got to get to this point, right, we built the detections, we're kind of moving into the, okay, how do we measure this, right? And, and as this is as we're going to start wrapping up, but we need to start thinking about what does our false positive rate look like? We need to think about those detections. Are some of these detections better suited as being hunting detections rather than something that our SOC's going to run on a regular basis? Again, we're probably not going to get rid of all the false positives, but we probably want to get a balance there. Um, Thinking about multi-behavior detections, I took the task scheduler detection I wrote, and then I added task and process. Then I added task and process network, trying to turn the screws on that thing to make it tighter and tighter. And what was interesting is, is you kind of found yourself, hey, I'm going to try to put this in there and see if I put this in. And all of a sudden, all of these other background noises of normal workstations happening in the background, all of a sudden caused this rule to explode. I'm like, well, that's not going to work. 
right? You need to think about those things. And sometimes running an emulation in a vacuum is great for an education purposes. If I'm trying to teach somebody maybe how to threat hunt, but if I'm trying to build a detection that's going to be worthy of deploying in my environment, maybe I want this to have some background noise and some other things happening around it. So I don't get like what I term, what I'm referred to as overfitting. So building a detection is overfit to the scenario is a very, very real and dangerous thing because you might have a detection that you're going, man, got the emulation plan that MITRE put together. It hits on every single one of these, but if it's so specific and it misses the adversary in the wild, then it doesn't do you any good. So you need to think about those kinds of things and be balancing those together. So there's again, testing and refinement that goes on here. So as any good engineering, um, as any any good engineering the solution that you got out there, um, the engineering part's fun, right? Everybody likes standing up a new system. Everybody likes building new detections. I run an emulation. I get to build detections off of that. Isn't it great? And then the reality of that operations and maintenance kind of sets in and go, now I got to tune this thing because I'm getting these false positives. Now I'm getting these other things that I'm missing. Now I got to, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. And that's the pain that we've got. And this kind of steps us back into that IT life cycle that we need to be thinking about as we're dealing with detections. So what happens when my security controls change, right? That endpoint tooling that I have that communicates with other endpoint tools may be changed and all of a sudden I've got half of my fleet that is uh, not seeing threats because it's no longer logging process creations, right? Things like that, misconfigurations happen. Uh, the architecture changes because the routing uh, was modified because we just acquired a new company and now we've got a partner network over here where before we had a different kind of network. And all of a sudden my data is not flowing to my analytics engine. Um, the logging format changes. Has this ever happened to anybody? I, I, I remember these kinds of things where you applied a service pack and all of a sudden the schema changed. And all of a sudden my logging upstream, uh, you know, again, my, my, uh, my aggregation platform was happy as a clam, but my analytics engine was not collecting the data or was not collecting and be able to parse and detect on the things I wanted it to parse on. We need to be monitoring these kinds of things throughout our detections and emulation is one way to test this, but there's obviously other ways to be able to test this. And that's kind of where we're going to be going with some of this next not here, but in some project work we're doing, um, is to help eliminate those potential blind spots because of the IT life cycles, right? The worst thing that we can do is have these things change and not be aware of this as a SOC, as a SecOps, as a CSERT organization to be able to detect these things. So I started off by talking about emulation. The question is, is do you need to have end-to-end -end emulation? There's not a right or wrong answer. Um, you got to weigh the pros and cons, right? There is um, some personnel intensive time and effort that has to go into some of these things, but things like the MITRE uh, emulation plans kind of help chip away at this. Um, we built a lot of this stuff on our own. Um, I built the emulations. I had a, a partner of ours who uh, built um, on our team, built some additional tooling to automate this the ingestion of these events, but we use it for gamification and instruction of analysts to kind of help up level them. So again, it depends on what you're doing with the data sets but you can absolutely do these kinds of things. If you want to start with the atomic tests, do it. If you want to do the smaller unit tests because they're easier to chew and they're more bite-sized, do it. Just do something when it comes to this kind of stuff because they're all great places to start. So to wrap up, um, I've got a couple different pieces of references here. Uh, the one on the top is a colleague of mine uh, was again referenced uh, earlier today. Uh, David has done a lot of work on detection as code. So once you start building your code and you want to go ahead and uh, apply a CICD pipeline to that data to be able to go ahead and push and pull it into your uh, systems. Uh, he's written some nice primers around detection as code. Uh, if you want to dig in more threat intel engineering, Megan Roddy wrote a book last year around threat detection. It's probably one of the first like solely built on threat detection. Uh, it's a good read. There's about 10 chapters that go through piece by piece. Definitely some good tips in there. The MITRE adversary emulation plans. Again, micro emulation plans and full scale emulation plans of threat actors, both on the financial motivated and the nation state that are out there. Definitely a good way to build emulations to go ahead and test some of this without having to create it all from scratch and yourself. Uh, and then obviously, if you want to go ahead and do atomic detections, by all means, the atomic red team stuff that Red Canary has out there is lights out. So with that, I think I made it under my time uh, window here. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn there. You can find me on the other socials on the other one, although I, since I can't figure out which social to be on, I'm not on many of them at this point. It's just kind of there as a storefront. Um, but thank you for your time. Um, I guess we have any questions or now would be the time to do that. And uh, thank you.